This is a lecture from Open Tuition. For the free lecture notes that go with this podcast, please visit opentuition.com. Well, we at last come to our final session together in relation to our F6 taxation studies. What we've done is to save, well, I certainly won't say the best until last, but probably the most boring until last. And that's the self-assessment and payment of tax by both companies and individuals. Dealt with within respectively our chapters 23 for companies and chapter 15 for individuals. Now, most of this is basic rules that need to be learnt. Sadly, for you anyway, I can't learn them for you. And hence, that is why most of these chapters is basically self-study. Again, there's no point in me reading it to you. You can read it for yourself and then learn. What I would suggest you do so far as these chapters is concerned, you know already that you should have obtained from one of the uh, official ACCA approved providers an examination or revision kit within which there will be many, many multiple choice questions, which is probably the most likely place in which you will find questions on this area of our syllabus. And it is by practicing those questions again within the kits or those of you who have study manuals provided by any of those providers will find extensive amounts of questions there too but only by doing those questions in tandem with the reading of the notes will you get to grips with it again this is a tedious exercise trying to learn basic administration it's almost law rather than taxation so my suggestion is do it hand in hand with exercises uh, multi mostly multiple choice questions that you'll find within the, as I say, ACCA official providers, exam kits and other material. But what I want to do with you is to pick out from this the most important doing things, i.e. the things that you have to do, calculations that you have to perform, uh, to perform rather, rather than merely regurgitating learnt knowledge. Now, when it comes to chapter 23 and dealing with companies, I'm going to deal with that one first, we've actually dealt with the most important aspects of that. And that is when we pay our tax. If you remember, I hope you do, that on our introduction to chapter 22, dealing uh, with groups, I went back and recapped over a little bit of chapter 16 as regards the basic preparation of a corporate tax computation, and then moved to look at chapter 23, wherein we dealt with the payment of tax. Pulling out from that, probably the most important part of it, and that was under what circumstances would a company be required to make quarterly instalment payments rather than pay its tax on what would otherwise have been its normal due date. Now, I hope you remember from that that a company would normally pay its tax nine months and one day after the end of the chargeable accounting period for which the corporate tax computation has been prepared. But if a company becomes large within a chargeable accounting period, i.e. it has profits in excess of the relevant profit limit. Now I say the relevant profit limit there, that of course is based on the figure given on your rates and allowances pages of £1.5 million. But remember, if you are dealing with a group situation, we divide that profit limit by the number of related 51% group companies. So having established what the relevant profit limit is for the company that you are dealing with, we now see an augmented profit. Remember what that was, that is your taxable total profit plus franked investment income, FII there. If we are now talking about an augmented profit in excess of that profit limit, then the company is large. I trust that you recall that if you were not large for the previous accounting period, then you will not now have to make quarterly instalment payments for this accounting period. But having become large in the current period, if we now estimate that the company will be large in the next accounting period, then for that next accounting period, the company will be required to make quarterly instalment payments. So let's have a little example just to illustrate what we did back, as I say, when we introduced chapter 22 on groups there and see whether you can recollect what those issues were and how we dealt with quarterly instalment payments and the cash flow problems that that would immediately give rise to when you make that transition, 
from making your normal payments nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period to then moving to the quarterly installment payment system. So let's imagine, therefore, that our company has prepared accounts for a year ended 31st of March 16. And for that accounting year end 31st of March 16, it has recorded a TTP of 1.7 million. We are then informed that the company is a single company without any related 51% group companies. That means that its profit limit is the basic 1.5 million. We then discover that this is the uh, only time, the first time, that we have had a profit in excess of 1.5 million. That, of course, means that for the immediately preceding accounting period, the year ended 31st of March 15, we were not large. So, if we were not large in the year ended 31st of March 15, we are not required to make quarterly instalment payments for the year ended March 16. So that TTP of 1.7 million would then, of course, be charged to corporate tax at what is now the uniform rate and the only rate you need to know for your syllabus of 20%. So corporation tax at 20%, presumably, therefore, would be, what's that, £340,000, I think. And when would that be due? That would be due nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period. Well, the accounting period end date was the 31st of March 16, so nine months and one day after the end of that period, it would be due the 1st of January 2017. But now that we have become large, it is essential that we now know what is our estimate of our TTP for the next accounting period. And that will therefore be the accounting year ended, the 31st of March 17. And let us say that that estimated TTP equals 1.8 million. Critically now, having become large within the year ended March 16, and now that we estimate large for the year ended 31st of March 17, we are now required to make quarterly instalment payments in relation to this period. So, those quarterly instalment payments, what will they initially at least be based on? Well, we've got an estimated TTP of 1.8 million times 20% will be an estimated liability of £360,000. We make quarterly instalment payments, so we divide by four. That, therefore, would be £90,000 for each such quarterly instalment payment. When will our first quarterly instalment payment fall due? Now, this will test you whether or not you have remembered that. Remember what we said, that our first quarterly instalment payment is due on the 14th day of the seventh month from the start of the accounting period. So the start of this accounting period ended 31st of March 17 was, of course, the 1st of April 16. Therefore, the 14th day, it will be due on the 14th of the seventh month from the start of the accounting period. Well, if you count through, that therefore will be the 14th of October. The 14th of October, within the year ended the 31st of March 17, is, of course, the 14th of October 16. And as we've said, £90,000 would then be due. Now, I said to note very carefully, not just how this system works, but the effect of this system in relation to the cash flow of the company. The company is used to paying its tax nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period. So as we have seen, for the year ended March 16, the tax would have been due and payable the 1st of January 17. Therefore, the company would have been anticipating that for its year ended 31st of March 17, that the due date for that, nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period, would have been the 1st of January 18. And no doubt, when it prepared its cash budgets, it would have put in for the year ended March 17, 
in January of that year a cash payment equal to the corporation tax on the estimated uh, TTP, which for us was £360,000. Sadly, of course, that will now be incorrect in terms of the timing of these payments. And look at the timing effect. A total payment of 360 would have been expected under the normal rules on the 1st of January 18. Instead, based on this estimate, and if it remains that figure throughout the period, we are going to make quarterly instalment payments of £90,000 starting from the 14th of October 16. Just look at the difference in time. We're going to start paying this year's tax on the 14th of October 16 rather than having to wait until the 1st of January 18 before we would have to pay. Look again at the impact of that date. That date the date on which we start making payments for the year ended March 17 is before even we have settled the liability for the last accounting period, the year ended March 16, because that's not due until the 1st of January 17. I hope now you can see the serious cash flow effect of the transition from your normal due date to the quarterly instalment payment system. We're going to have to start paying this year's tax before even we have paid last year's tax. Now, of course, what would then happen? You'll follow on with your remaining quarterly instalment payments. Big surprise, A, they're quarterly, so they're every three months. So the next one due would be the 14th of January there of 17, followed by the 14th of April 17, followed by the 14th of July 17. Now, in real life, would they all be £90,000? Well, probably not, because, of course, you might be estimating at the beginning of October 16 that you're going to have a TTP of £1.8 million. For what, remember, we're now only halfway through an accounting period that will end the 31st of March 17. Well, by the time you get to January 17, you may have updated, of course, that estimate and therefore different payments may be made. And as you get ever closer to the end of the accounting period, hopefully you get ever closer to working out the correct, the closest at least, estimate of that liability. Right. That is, I would say, the single most important issue. But clearly in multiple choice questions, as I've suggested, any parts of the admin may indeed be tested upon you. The next part of that chapter deals with the corporation tax return. The heading here is self-assessment. And of course, it is the requirement of any company not to wait until it receives a tax return and then the requirement to submit that tax return, albeit that companies now have to submit the tax return electronically. It's all now done online. But if a company has a liability for an accounting period, it's its responsibility to actually submit that tax return. They can't just wait to be asked by HMRC. Self-assessment puts the responsibility well and truly on the company to submit that tax return. Now, although we've seen here how and when it is we may have to pay the tax, whether the normal due dates nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period uh, or under the quarter instalment payment system. So far as the submission of the corporate tax return and what that should then have is the correct amount over all of the tax that needs to have been paid for the accounting period ended. In fact, we have got rather longer in which to submit the tax return. And that is, it will have to be submitted, they are due 12 months after the end of the financial accounting period. Now notice there, I've said financial accounting period rather than for corporate tax purposes, chargeable accounting period. Because we know that although they are usually the same, Companies normally prepare their accounts to a year-end date, and that year-end becomes the chargeable accounting period. If a company, for example, prepared accounts, the financial accounts, for the 15 months through to the 31st of March 16, 
then we would have to divide that into two chargeable accounting periods. Those two chargeable accounting periods would be firstly the 12 months to, well it would be the first 12 months of that period, so that would be December 15. In relation to which the tax would be payable, nine months and one day after the end of the accounting period, or if the company was large, of course, would start by making the quarterly instalment payments. We'd then have a second chargeable accounting period for the balance of that period of time, for the period of account, a separate chargeable accounting period, the three months to the 31st of March 16. And again, tax would be due separately to be paid in relation to that period by its relevant due dates. But in terms of your tax return here, our corporation tax return, then that is by reference to the financial accounting period. And as I've just said, and you'll read in section two of the chapter 23 course notes there, it has to be submitted within 12 months from the end of the financial accounting period. So we'll have to submit, therefore, by 31st of March 17. So the corporate tax computations for both the chargeable accounting period, year ended December 15 and three months to March 16, we'll have to submit those tax returns by the 31st of March 17. It may, of course, be much earlier than that. It will indeed be much earlier than that by when we must pay our tax. So we may, pay, we may be paying our tax earlier, possibly on an estimate, of course, before then, eventually, we determine the final corporate tax liability. And that means that we are required to submit that corporate tax return with the final figures of the corporate tax computation and the tax amounts due within 12 months of the end of the financial accounting period. Now, the rest of chapter 23, again, is various administrative issues, one or two of which are familiar with what we've, in fact, already covered with in terms of the administration system on VAT within chapter 25. But basically, it's a sit down and learn it exercise. You're not going to just sit down and learn it parrot fashion by just reading it out to yourself and trying to memorize it. Use, again, those questions from the ACCA official providers study material. You definitely need an exam stroke revision kit. You will find in most of those plenty of multiple choice questions that will allow you to practice in this area. OK, that said, what we'll now do is to turn our attention to chapter 15, which, of course, deals with the self-assessment system and the payment of tax so far as the income tax or personal tax systems are concerned. We'll be dealing basically there with both income tax and also with capital gains tax. So we'll just uh, pause now while we uh, or while you possibly stop at this point and review through the remainder of chapter 23 before then returning for us to review and look at chapter 15, where in again what we will look at is the submission of the tax return and when it is that an individual must pay both their income tax and capital gains tax in relation to a tax year. I look forward to talking to you about that in the none too distant future. OK, time now, therefore, to turn our attention to Chapter 15 and the self-assessment system that applies to individuals, and when, of course, then individuals pay their personal tax liabilities. So. For the tax year 2015-16, which of course will be the one used within any questions that we have to deal with, our tax return will be due for submission and any tax payable, we'll talk about what tax in a moment, any tax payable will be due by the following 31st of January. So for our tax year 15-16, the following 31st of January will of course be the 31st of January 17 that otherwise known as the date by which any balancing payment will be due. We'll explain that again in a moment's time. Now, the amount of tax that is payable in relation to the tax year will include any income tax payable by the individual. And if that individual, of course, was self-employed, and it is usually only the self-employed that have to make, uh, as we'll see, these payments, because for most individuals, the payment of their income tax will be deducted at source. Most uh, individuals chargeable to income tax in the UK 
will of course be employees where the pay as you earn system will have ensured that tax will have been deducted at source so there should not therefore be any requirement to pay any more tax through the self-assessment system by the 31st of January following the end of the tax year but of course if you are self-employed then there is no one there to tax your trading profits so all of your income tax in relation to your self-assessed profits is going to have to be uh, settled through the self-assessment system and of course if you are self-employed then not only do you have to settle your income tax uh, liability payable but you also have to pay your national insurance contributions those of course will be as we know class 2 and the rather more larger figures usually class 4 and I what may happen from year to year it may never happen at all of course but if there's any CGT to be paid then that too must be settled by self-assessment so any amount of income tax that has not already been paid at source through PAYE through deduction of tax at source tax credits like on bank interest there any amounts of income tax still to be paid will have to be settled by the following 31st of January along with your national insurance contributions and any CGT liability for the tax year now it is of course mostly to do with the self-employed as we have said and in relation to them specifically what the HMRC will do is not wait around until the 31st of January 17 before they have collected any tax in relation to our tax year 1560 for example if you are self-employed then you will be assessed on profits using a current year basis system which for 1516 would look at the accounting year ended within that tax year so if you for example as a self-employed person have prepared accounts to the say 30th of June then it would be the year ended 30th of June 15 which accounts which adjusted profit would be assessed in the 1516 tax year so that tax on profits made for the year ended June 15 would not have to be paid until the 31st of January 17 now that is way way too long an interval period between when you make your profits and when you make your tax and that is why we see that taxpayers may have to make what we've abbreviated here to POA what you'll be reading about of course in the OT course notes in chapter 15 is payments on account but payments on account will only be required for two of these taxes for any income tax that may be payable and for your class 4 NIC there are never payments on account required for either your class 2 NI or your CGT no payments on account in relation to class 2 NIC and capital gains tax payments on account are only required for your income tax payable figure and for your class 4 national insurance contributions so firstly when are these payments on account due to be paid they are due to be paid first of two payments on account the 31st of January in the tax year so if we are dealing with what's due in relation to our 1516 tax year then of course the first of 31st of January within that tax year will be the 31st of January 16 31st of January 16 the 31st of January falling within the 1516 tax year the following 31st of July therefore will be the 31st of July of 16 so the way in which your overall amount of tax payable will be settled in relation to the tax year 1516 we may have made two payments on account firstly 31st of January 16 secondly the 31st of July 16 and then with what we refer to as we use the expression a moment ago our balancing payment a balancing payment due by the date by which you need to settle this tax liability for our tax year and that date the 31st of January 17 so by the 31st of January 17 you come in with any balancing payment 
the amount of tax payable for the 15-16 tax year over and above what you've already paid through your payments on account. Those payments on account, as we have just seen, would have themselves been payable firstly the 31st of January 16 and then the 31st of July 16. So what are those payments on account based on? Now we said that the payments on account are required in relation to your income tax payable and class 4 NIC. It should be no surprise therefore that that is what you now see written here that is based on income tax payable and class 4 NIC but for when? Well logically for the preceding tax year. So it's not based on an estimate it is based on the amount of income tax payable and class 4 NIC that was payable for the preceding tax year which for us of course would therefore have been the 2014-15 tax year. Now having said that not all taxpayers will be required to make payments on account. It is possible of course that maybe through the self-assessment system for even for an employee if they had for example assessable benefits that had not been correctly accounted for through the PAYE system that maybe a small amount of tax was still payable. Again, it's usually dealing with, as we said, the self-employed, but maybe there's a small amount of tax payable, maybe because the PAYE system has not been able to quite correctly get the amount of tax due to issues pertaining to assessable benefits, or maybe there was a small amount of property income assessment that the taxpayer had, which again, where no tax would have been deducted at source and has to be settled through the self-assessment system. But if the amount of tax so payable is relatively small, there will still be no payments on account required. So there'll be no payments on account, requir uh, payments on account required if the income tax payable and the class 4 NI, these are the figures of course upon which the payments on account are based, if the amounts payable and the class 4 NIC, income tax and class 4 payable, for the preceding tax year was less than either a thousand pounds, so just a financial figure, or 20% of the total income tax liability, notice income tax liability, so before deducting the tax that had been deducted at source, 20% of the total income tax liability and class 4 NICs. Now these are the essential things that you need to know. So I'd like you to pause at this particular point and go back through the points that we've made and also then turn to, if you have not already, chapter 15 and the first section that deals with, at least the narrative part of this before the example, that deals with the self-assessment system and the due dates for the payment of tax. Once done, come back and what we'll do is to work a little example together. Okay, let's have a look at a little example therefore. Now I've given you here information for our taxpayer as regards their tax position, their personal tax position for the tax year 2014-15, where we see that the individual off their income tax computation has an income tax liability of £10,000 of which £2,000 had been settled through tax deduction at source. That left us therefore with an income tax payable figure of 8000 That would be income tax payable of 8000 Now of course we discover that, as we would suspect, that this individual was self-employed, therefore had paid class 2 NICs and some class 4 NICs. The class 2 of course at the set weekly rate for the tax year concerned, 1415, totaling there 143 pounds, and the class 4 NIC based on the level of tax adjusted trading profit, amount of 2000 pounds. Taxpayer also for that tax year, 1415, had a CGT liability of 3857. That, if my arithmetic is correct anyway, I think comes to a total tax of 14,000 pounds. And what our requirement now is, is to compute the payments on account. 
So again, take a moment to note down this example, to look back at your notes and to establish what you think will be the payments on account. Look at what those payments on account are based upon. Go back to your note, see what they are based on, see what is excluded in determining the payments on account and work for me please what you think to be the payments on account and state the dates that they will be due in line with the 2015-16 tax year. Remember any payments on account for 15-16, that's the tax year we're dealing with, will be based on the information as provided here in relation to the 14-15 tax year. So based on what happened in 14-15, I want you to calculate the payments on account here, as you can see at the bottom, for 2015-16 tax year and to state, that should be very easy, when those payment on account due dates would be. So pause this for the moment, therefore, make a note of the information as said and calculate those payments on account and state the due dates, please. So the payments on account, therefore, for our 15-16 tax year are based, as we know, on though I didn't label it then, you needed to know it, the amount of income tax payable for the preceding tax year, 1415, that is £8,000, plus Class 4 NICs. Remember, Class 2 NI and CGT liability, there are no payments on account in relation to those liabilities. They will simply be settled as and if and when they arise. They will be settled the 31st of January, following the end of the tax year. No payments on account in relation to class 2 NIC and the CGT liability. So the basis for our payments on account, £10,000. Income tax payable, 8 plus class 4, 2. Class 4 NIC, of course, 2000. That will be split into two payments on account. So 8,000 plus 2,000 divided by 2 is, I think, £5,000. When will we therefore pay £5,000? It will be due on each of the 31st of January in the tax year and then the 31st of July following that. The yeah, first due date, the following 31st of July. So 31st of January 16, following 31st of July, obviously 31st of July 16. So take a moment to check through, make sure therefore you're happy with the story so far before we then go on to 2015-16 and see then what the real amounts of tax liability, tax payable and the various NI and NECGT costs amounted to to establish then the balancing payment that will be due on, as we know, the 31st of January following the end of the 15-16 tax year, the balancing payment the 31st of January therefore 2017. So, based on the calculations of the uh, tax for 2014-15, we've been able then to determine the payments on account that will have to be paid for the 2015-16 tax year. We work that out based on for 14-15, two figures, the amount of income tax payable and the class 4 NI. Remember, it's only those two figures. We don't have payments on account in relation to the other type of NIC, class 2, and of course for CGT. Those are specific liabilities that are payable by the normal due date, the 31st of January following the end of the tax year. So we've got our payments on account in total, uh, £10,000. That divided, as we saw, into two payments on account, £5,000 each being due on the 31st of January 16 and the 31st of July 16. Remember the 31st of January in the tax year of assessment and the following 31st of July. We took it for granted, however, that the payments on account would be required. And indeed, they will. Don't doubt that for one moment. But of course, we did say that there were a couple of circumstances in which, depending on the amount of the payments on account, that actually we may not have to make them. So just that check. Payments on account will be required here, as we've now written in, and hopefully you too will write in. Payments on account will be required for 1516, as the £10,000 worth that we've computed exceeds, now there were two figures, £1,000 or 20% of the total income tax that was uh, 
uh, due there for the tax year plus £2,000 worth of Class 4 NIs. Now, if we just go back to what we saw for uh, our 1415 tax year there and to the previous statement, which is where this comes from, that there would be no payments on account would have fallen due if the income tax payable, there is our income tax payable, 8,000. If the income tax payable plus the class 4 NICs for the tax year, fitting tax year was less than that. The class 4 NICs, that as we know was 2,000, so the two 10,000 pounds. So if that was less than a thousand pounds, uh, clearly it isn't a 10,000, it's not less than 1,000, or 20% of the total income tax liability and the class 4 and I. There's your income tax liability. And again, we know that 2,000 is the class 4 and I. So coming back to the calculations here, the payments on account will be required as the 10,000 has exceeded the 1,000 pound limit and whatever is 20% of the income tax liability for that 1415 tax year plus the class 4 NI. That would give you 2,400. Clearly, 10,000 pounds is bigger than that. So that means, therefore, that, yeah, those 5,000 pound payment due on each of the relevant due dates would be payable. Right. So based on what happened in 1415, we're able to work out what payments on account were required in relation to 1516 tax year and when they will be payable. Now, of course, once we have got to the end of the 1516 tax year, we'll then be able to compute what the real liabilities were for that year. So if we move our example on now, and again, I'd like you to uh, note down the following information. So if you need to pause this at any point, please do. But for 1516 now, as we move on for our taxpayer, we discover that he's got an income tax liability of £11,000 and upon which income tax has been deducted at source, amounting to 2000 Meaning, of course, as I'll now label on this occasion, the income tax payable was 9000 Again, as we know, our hero here was self-employed, so the two types of NIC became payable. The class two, which for our 1516 tax year will be, as we know, at £2.80 a week, should I hope come to £146. Based on the tax-adjusted trading profit, the class four NIC is £3,000. Once again, we've made capital gains in excess of our annual exempt amount, and therefore a CGT liability has arisen, this time 2354. Total, again, hopefully, as long as my arithmetic is correct, total tax payable, £14,500. So what we've now got to do, now we know what is the actual tax payable in total and the makeup thereof. What we now need to do is to work out, so on the 31st of January 17, what balancing payment will then be due to be paid in relation to the 1516 tax year. Hence our requirements here. To begin with, the obvious one, calculate the balancing payment due on the 31st of January 17 for the 1516 tax year. Well, that should not be difficult. We know what the total tax payable now is for that year, and we know how much of it has already been settled via payments on account. If we take those payments on account away from that total tax payable, we'll therefore have the figure that we need. But what is a more <coughs> interesting uh, exercise as well is I'm asking you here to compute the total amount of tax that would be payable at that date, the 31st of January 17. Now, what do I mean by that? We've said and we can easily compute what will be the balancing payment. That, of course, is what's due for the 1516 tax year. But the 31st of January 17 requires another payment to be made. Now, what will that be? That, of course, will be the first payment on account for the 1617 tax year. That will be due on the, first, the 31st of January within that year, the 2016-17 tax year. So that now we should be able to compute. You've got the figures for 1516, upon which the payments on account for 1617 will be determined. So you should be able to work out what the payments on account will be. 
and that first payment on account will also have to be settled on that date the 31st of January 17. The 31st of January of any year is a date that self-employed people don't like. It's a very bad day because not only do they have to settle the balancing payment for the preceding tax year, they then have to make their first payment on account for what is then the current tax year here, the 2016-17 tax year. Okay, I'd like you therefore to think that one through. Uh, again, the calculation of the balancing payment should not be tricky, as we've just said. There is the total tax payable. How much of that has already been settled through payments on account? The difference is the balancing payment. You then have got to originate the calculation, as we did previously, for the payments on account now in relation to the 16-17 tax year based on figures that you take from the 15-16 tax year leave you therefore to determine what those figures are so again you might wish to pause at this particular point do your calculations thereof and then come back and let's hopefully agree your numbers with my numbers okay let's see what we've got then now hopefully again as we said simple enough calculation for the balancing payment due for the 31st of january 17 once you know what the total tax payable is for the 15 16 tax year and you know the amount that's already been paid on account, the payments on account were £10,000, then all we've got to do therefore is take one figure from the other and we have got our balancing payment due. That here, £4,500. As we said, the 31st of January, a very bad day for the self-employed because not only do they settle, as we see here, the final balancing payment due for the 2015-16 tax year, They've then got to make their first payment on account for the current, what then would be the 2016-17 tax year. So what's that based on? Now hopefully we remembered, of course, that we uh, determine our payments on account for the following year based on the current year, income tax payable plus class 4NI. So the payments on account for 16-17 based on the 2015-16 income tax payable that was £9,000, plus the class 4 NI, 3000 total 12000 That is split into two payments on account, and that's therefore obviously £6,000 each. The first of those payments, as we knew, due the 31st of January. So we have to pay the 6000 payment on account, the balancing payment for the previous year, that is total £10,500, will have to be paid out on or by the 31st of January 17. Of course, then in relation to the 1617 tax year, we'll have a further £6,000 to pay on or by the 31st of July of 2017. Take time, therefore, to have a look through, make sure that you are happy with that. The only other thing that I'll make mention of in these notes, other than that, uh, basically look at the OT course notes, and just again, down to you, to sit down, review through, learn what are the basic administrative issues, and again, practice those, as I said, by reference to, in one of the approved ACCA providers, uh, revision or examination kits, a multitude of questions that you will find, usually multiple choice questions on those issues. In that way, you'll make some sense of it. Don't try and sit down and just read through every section of those notes. It'll be in one eye and proverbially out the other there. It'll be important for you to again go through it with exercises. Okay. Um, other than that, the only other issue that I'd like to refer to, uh, we said of course that not only do we have to deal with the payment of the tax, but also the submission of the tax return. So in section four of chapter 15, in the notes you'll find details of the self-assessment tax return. I'll just pull out and say at this point, however, just a couple of, of issues. One, unlike with corporate tax, where everything has to be filed electronically, what you're able to do, so far as your personal tax is concerned, you are able to submit still the old fashioned paper return, as well as also instead doing it electronically. Now, if we do it electronically, then we know that our deadline date for any balancing payment due is the 31st of January following the end of the tax year. 
So it is therefore that that date for the 1516 tax return, tax year, we therefore would have to submit our tax return and pay the balancing payment due by the same date, 31st of January following the end of the tax year, the 31st of January 17. If, however, you don't want to do it electronically, again, not all individuals who pay tax may be able to operate such a system, then you are able and required to submit a paper return. Now, again, that paper return, that tax return must be submitted and the tax must be paid by the same due date, the 31st of January. But they also offer a further option as well. And that is, if you complete and sign, submit your paper return by the 31st of October within the tax year, so for the 15-16 tax year, if you submit it, therefore, by the 31st of January, following the end of the tax year, sorry, the 31st of October, I'll give on, following the end of the tax year, so for 15-16, that would be by the 31st of October 2016. So if you submit your paper return by 31 October 2016, then they, the HMRC, will actually calculate your tax for you. So all you have to do is to submit information about your income and about your outgoings, your expenses that are allowable for taxation. They then will calculate your tax for you. They will then will notify you by the 31st of January 17, the due date for payment, how much tax you owe. And they will then pay that uh, tax, as we said, by the due date. So if you don't know how to operate the electronic system, or you're not able to, you can indeed submit a paper return. And if you're equally not able to calculate your own figure of tax, send that tax return in for the 15-16 tax year by the 31st of October following the end of the year, 31st of October 2016. They will take your information about income and outgoings and calculate the amount of tax that you need to pay. They will inform you of that prior to the due date and you will pay it by the due date the 31st of January 17. Okay, now the rest of the stuff in chapter 15, as I've said, that's stuff that you've just got to sit down, review through, and ostensibly learn. I would make the point, though, as I've said before in these lectures, that you don't want to be troubling your brain with this memory exercise, this learning exercise, until you've got to uh, grips with the basic computations. So you should be more than competent at working the income tax computations and establishing the individual content. Any figures of income, be it employment income with assessable benefits, be it the tax adjusted trading profit, be it property income, be it interest income, be it dividend income. Make sure you can prepare your income tax comp. Make sure you can prepare the corporation tax computation, both dealing with a single company and how might that change if you operated within a group of companies. You can work a capital gains tax computation for an individual. Obviously, the corporate tax computation for the company incorporates those gains. You know how to calculate VAT and you understand the basic admin of the VAT system. You know how to compute IHT payable in lifetime and then, as it is usually, payable as a result of the death of the taxpayer. Make certain you can do all of those things before you start to sit down and look through these administration sections. But as I say, when you do, have open with you a uh, question bank where you've got questions on these issues and work through on that basis. It will make more sense of basically otherwise what is a very, very dry area indeed of just learning. Other than that, this is the last session, as uh, we have said, in relation to our 2015-16 tax year and therefore the lectures for the exams from September of 2016 through to March 2017. All I can say therefore is to wish you the best of luck and hope that having worked through these notes and practiced the examples that we have here, you then used that knowledge and practice to be able to deal with the exam standard questions that you'll find, and indeed past exam questions that you'll find, within your exam or revision kit from your chosen approved ACCA provider. 
Do that and you'll be well prepared for your exam. Good luck.